is the second traditional woodworking workbench that I've made. It's made out of hickory. It's got a tool well on one side, a leg vise right over there, a really ugly shelf on bottom that I need to replace, or down below that I need to replace, which is something that I'll do in this video. And I put those Rockler retracting casters on the, the bottom sides, uh, the sides of the workbench to make it a little bit more mobile when you need to move it around. But they retract, they get out of the way, allowing you to have a nice solid foundation any other time. So there's a couple things that I want to do in this video. I want to kind of give it a freshen up because I'm trying to sell it. I also want to uh, sell it or give it away, trade it, I'm not sure. Uh, I also want to build the shelf to go down below like I just mentioned. And I need to fix a dumb mistake that I made. Let me bring in closer and that's where we're going to start because it's going to be the most time consuming. Take a second to zoom in right here. Look at this seam we've got going on right here. Uh, this is opening up, which is a no-no. So there's one of two things going on. Either A, I did not leave this glue up in clamps long enough and it's starting to separate, or B, this is just a glue-starved joint and I did not have enough glue in the joint. Considering this is the only one that's like this, I'm going to go with B. I made the mistake of having a glue-starved joint, so it's kind of opened up. So this is a, my little pocket flashlight, and you can see if I go all the way to the end, See the light go all the way down there? Yeah, it's all the way through the workbench. So this seam needs to be sealed, and it needs to be sealed really, really well. And for that, I'm going to use some penetrating epoxy. That I'm going to be using is this Total Boat penetrating epoxy. This stuff is way more thin, way more liquid-like than uh, like a typical high performance epoxy. This stuff will really get down into the seams and any little nook and cranny that it can get into, it's going to get into, and then it's gonna harden and seal it up just fine. It's gonna hold everything together nice and tight, which is, exa which is exactly what I need in that particular seam. Here's my game plan with the epoxy. I don't want to just focus on that crack. I wanna tape the entire top surface. I'm using just regular packing tape tape the entire top surface. That way I can roll this thing upside down and work on the bottom side of the workbench top and fill not only that crack that I know is there, but also take the time to look for any other little defects. You know, this is a, a once in a very not so often opportunity to do this. So I want to use this opportunity to find any little defects and pour some epoxy into anything. Just, you know, a little bit of preventative maintenance as well as fixing the problem that I know is there. I'm glad I went ahead and taped the entire top surface because there's a few more bad spots seen on the bottom side than what was visible on top. So I think that's, uh, I think doing all of this right now is a good move. <laughs> I ended up using more epoxy than what I think is actually necessary, but I, I mixed up too much, so I just tried to find excuses to use it, you know? Um, I'm not gonna do this again. <laughs> this is incredibly inconvenient, so I might as well overkill uh, any of these little itty bitty tiny nooks and crannies or whatever. Uh, so with that curing, uh, setting up, I want it to at least fully set up before I flip the bench over. Uh, this is upside down, obviously, so on the bottom side here is where I wanna put a slat shelf and that means I need two cleats to go on the inside of both of these rails. The cleat for that slat shelf doesn't need to be pretty. As a matter of fact, it's never gonna be seen. And I happen to have this one long, weird, odd-shaped section of walnut that'll do the job just fine, except, yeah, it's pretty bent. So I'll cut it in half and joint one edge and we'll see what we got.
All right, so I, I've clearly cut more than what I need. I need a total of 39 inches for the entire length of the shelf, and I have 60. I've got way too much. So 39 is right here, which means this one, actually, I'll probably leave this one in, on there because I'm losing 3 eighths of an inch for each one of the joints. I've decided to use the tongue and groove joint, uh, well, a tongue and groove joint, and the bits that I have have a 3 eighths of an inch um, tongue and groove. So I'm going to lose 3 eighths of an inch per board. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Well, this one's not going to have the loss on one side. So let's just say 8, uh, 3 eighths times 8. Well, it's 3 divided by 8 times 8. The 8s cancel each other out, so it's 3 inches. I need to add 3 inches to my overall length of 39 inches that I need. And actually, I'm at 45. So 39 plus 3 is 42. I'm going to have plenty with these right here selected. And I've got three extra boards that I milled up for no reason, but that's fine because I didn't really know how much I needed. Uh, I didn't know how much my yield was going to be as I was milling the boards up. The bit I'm using is a tongue and groove set, but it's one single bit. So this will cut both the tongue and the groove depending on how high you have this set in your router. I'm going to plunge this all the way down uh, so that this top cutter is about halfway through the thickness of our material, and that'll cut a single groove, and the rest of it will be below the surface of the router table, not touching anything. Between these two cutters is a bearing that the material will ride up against, and the distance from the bearing to the outside of this cutter is 3 eighths of an inch. So that means I'm going to lose 3 eighths of an inch off of the width of every one of my boards when I'm cutting the tongue. I'm going to set this to cut the groove first and for that i just need to eyeball this it doesn't have to be perfect i'm just going to eyeball it so it is dead center by eye which doesn't really make much sense <laughs> dead center by eye i'm just eyeballing it to make sure it's center and uh, we'll get all of these grooves cut uh, it doesn't have to be perfectly centered because we're going to set the, the tongue part the elevation or the height of the bit for the tongue based upon uh, one of these pieces that's already cut for the group. A couple things going on. First, we're still upside down because the epoxy has not yet dried. I'm going to let it sit like this overnight, and I'll finish this up tomorrow. Uh, but before I leave for the night, uh, I need to lay out all of my boards, or I want to lay out all of my boards to cut the final one to length or width rather, so that I have my final layout and I want to leave about a quarter of an inch gap so that I have a little bit of room for expansion and contraction. I'm, I'm not going to nail these in place, they're just going to sit in place. It's going to be a shelf that's going to be just fine. So all these boards have a good side and I determined that before I cut all the joints and I labeled them with just a piece of blue painter's tape, just easily identifiable. This board does not have a groove cut on this side so it's going to go all the way over to here on this side over here. Uh, but remember, good side is blue painter's tape, so good side is towards the ground in this orientation. I can set them in place and lay out all the boards. Now, they're all just a little bit long, and that's because I wanted to fine tune the length as I installed them with this thing upright. The reason being is both of these boards, uh, both of these beams rather, the front and back rail, are slightly bowed inward just a little bit. So we're wider on the outside, narrower on the, on the inside. And if I just cut everything to the narrow measurement, I'm going to have an awkward gap on either side. So uh, I'll, I'll cut these to the final length right before the final set in place. Uh, also, I'm not going to close up these joints right now. Yes, each one of these boards uh, can be closed like so, but it's just going to be a lot easier to not deal with that, that joint because that router bit makes it pretty darn tight by straddling the joint. And what I mean by that is I don't have to join the boards like so. I can actually stack them on the tongue. So they're at, see that? They're at a different height. I can stack them like that and still get my width measurement. So I'll have a gap in between, good side faces down, and I'll stack the, the groove on top of the tongue and then the tongue over here on top of the groove like so, so we're alternating height, but we're still taking that 3 eighths of an inch into consideration for the joint just to get our measurement. So good side facing down, the next board comes in like so, and the orientation here, the, the um, sequence of which boards go where at this point doesn't matter. Let's see what kind of measurement we have here. 
So that last little strip is only going to be about an inch and a half. I went ahead and cut that board, and as you can see here, this last section is an inch and a half in width, and the gap between the, this board and this leg is about a quarter of an inch. I, I'm thinking that's going to be enough for this panel to expand and contract. Who knows? Time will tell. Uh, but all this, like I said, is going to be loose fit. None of this is going to be glued. None of it's going to be nailed in place. It's just a shelf down below on a workbench. But it is past my bedtime. It's 9.30 at night. So I'll pick up sometime tomorrow. It is the next day, and I'm about to lose my blue painter's tape for the good side. Remember, good side faces down in this orientation. I'm about to lose this to put some finish on it. So I'm going to go to the back side now, which is these, and just have a little red tick mark. This will all be covered up, not seen at all, but this tick mark with a red marker will let me know uh, when it's all said and done what side goes down. If I see the tick mark when I'm installing, well, then it's upside down. I am using some homemade garnet shellac. I just mixed this up with some denatured alcohol and some garnet shellac flakes. Nothing special, and I have no idea what pound cut this is because I just kind of eyeballed it based upon my previous use of shellac and unfortunately I don't have any brushes so I'm gonna be a little bit wasteful by using this big rag One of the great benefits of using shellac is the piece I started on, it's already dry and all I did was just move the camera around, right? This is already dry. Uh, and I'm not going to go with a second coat, I'm not going to go with sanding with a bunch of stuff. This is a shop project and really this is a utilitarian shelf. So a bunch of stuff's just going to be piled on top of it. Now the reason I'm using this really beautiful figured wood, right? I just want to give you a little bit right there. Look at all of that curl. These, all these boards are so dense and, and figure like that. It's incredible, both sides. Look at all that curl. I've never seen curly ash, let alone this dense, you know? So anyway, why am I using this beautiful figured wood for a shop project? Uh, that's because there's, there's defects in all of this wood. It's, it's got tension set, so some of this stuff actually has some cracks in it. And for that reason, I can't really trust it for like a furniture piece to go in the house or something, but for a shop project, I can still get the, the wow factor, that beautiful look, and not really worry about a crack or something like that. So, for example, this one, I guess you gotta move it the right way to see it. Right, where am I, yeah, you can see that. See that crack right there? Uh, and you can see it evident on the end grain. So there's a little bit of tension set. Uh, this is not acceptable for a piece of furniture, but thrown on the bottom of a workbench, on a shelf, it's gonna look killer. And these little cracks here and there that some of them have, actually, I think this is the only one that's on both sides, so you actually will see a little bit of a crack. Everything else has it on the bottom side, so it's not gonna be visible at all. But what I'm, what I'm getting at is, it's okay. It's okay in this situation. It's gonna make the workbench look beautiful until it's covered up with tools and other stuff to where you can't even see it anyway. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there. So I'm not trying to chop up some really nice, awesome, sought after lumber for a, a shelf on the bottom of a workbench.
All the work that I wanted to get done is done. And before I wrap this video up, let's go ahead and talk workbench stuff for just one second. I added a tool well to this workbench and a lot of people say that a tool well is just there to collect junk. And that's 100% right. That's not a bad thing. A tool well is there to collect stuff. And that's why I want one on all of my workbenches going forward if I ever build another one. Uh, because the more junk that's in here, the less junk that's in my way. That's the whole point of them, and I love it for that. Some people complain about sawdust and chips and shavings and all this stuff building up inside there. Big deal. You scoop it out, throw it on the floor, sweep it up. It's, it's sawdust, it, you know, woodworking. Every time these casters are seen in the video, they always get all kinds of questions. These are the Rockler workbench casters. They're retractable, right? So that it's not touching the ground right now, or it's not uh, holding any weight. And then you push this lever down, and then it puts the weight on the casters, allowing you to move it around. Once you have it in place, you kick these back up, and uh, they're, re they're retracted. And the, the legs of the workbench is on the floor, a nice, steady platform, which is what you want. The one thing that I've done is taken a piece of half-inch square tubing and connecting them, connected them with some bolts. That's easy to put one foot to control both levers. Is this my idea? Absolutely not. So many people did this before me, and I just copied it because it's a fantastic addition to an already great product. This is a leg vise because, as you can see, it attaches to the leg of a workbench. And this is my biggest recommendation for any workbench you have, whether it's just a, a screwed together 2x4 utility workbench with a plywood top, that's fine. You can put a leg vise on it. Whether it's a traditional workbench like this, you can put a leg vise on it. And basically, it's just one long screw, and these are inexpensive. This is like $40, the hardware for this super inexpensive and if if you look maybe you can see yeah the far right leg on this workbench i actually drilled the hole for this screw and all four of these legs that way if anybody else gets this workbench down the road they have the option to move it left or right if they are left or right handed so think about that when you build your workbench um, maybe you may, you may not be the last person to own it but anyway these were these vices are extremely strong extremely inexpensive also, if you have a leg vise, put a nail in the side of it. It's the absolute perfect location for a bench brush to get the dust off your workbench, and it's never in the way. It's always out of the way right here, and you always know where it's at. That's something that I've done to all of my leg vices. Uh, let's see, this particular leg vise works, well, all leg vices work by having the clamping force kind of in the middle of the leg vise chop, this piece right here. And what that, what mean, what that, results in is racking, right? So if you clamp something on the top side and you just continue to tighten this down, the bottom side is going to go further into the workbench and it's going to open up at, at the top. That's called racking. You don't want that on a vise. And there's a couple different ways to stop that. The most traditional way is to put a board inside the leg chop through the leg with a bunch of holes in it. And then you can stick a peg in those holes to stop it from going into the leg anymore much more easier approach is to use a wedge. That's it, just a simple wedge. I have the same wedge angle cut into the bottom of this leg chop, and what I do is tighten it till it touches the material up top, and then I can kick this forward with my foot and then give it just a little bit of a tighten. Loosen it up, pull this back. I've got some nails sticking through the top of this wedge so my foot can sit on top of this, pull it back very easily. A different piece of material, different thickness. Uh, tighten it down till it touches, kick the wedge forward, a little bit more tighten, you're good to go. Super simple, super easy, a tremendous amount of clamping force. If you make a workbench, put a leg vise on it. One caveat to using the wedge method is if you just use the wedge by itself, you have no way of keeping this piece perfectly vertical. It's going to swing on its only pivot point, which is the screw. So to prevent it from swinging or rotating as you're tightening it down, I have this piece of dowel that you can see on the side of the leg over here. It's actually fit into a hole on the back side of this leg chop, and that stops it from twisting clockwise as you tighten this down. And to kind of hold it in place, I actually have a little catch piece right here attached to the back side of this workbench. All of that I've gone into detail in a previous video. Uh, if you're interested, search YouTube or my website for Hickory Workbench. Structurally, this shelf is great. It's at the same height as the top of the rails. Everything lines up as it should, and there's enough room for expansion and contraction. However, the color 
as you can see, it doesn't match as well as I had hoped for and as much as I was expecting. And that's because the board that I tested and put up next to it that looks way better, it actually had a little bit more magenta hue in it than the actual pieces that I ended up going with. So, eh, oh well, it's a shelf on the bottom of a workbench. Like I said, it's just gonna be covered up and used and abused. As you saw, I just did a light sanding to the top of the workbench and I made sure to go in a consistent pattern so I know I'm taking an even amount all the way across it. It's pretty darn flat to begin with. I don't want to mess that up. Now, as far as putting a finish on it, I'm not going to. I sanded it with 80 grit and that's fine. You, you want a little bit of protection on a workbench so it doesn't get stained up tremendously. Some people do. I'm of the mindset now that it doesn't matter. It's a workbench. It's, it's going to be used and abused like it, like it should be, really. That's the whole point of making one. And I don't really care if cosmetically it it's, remains pretty and pristine for a long amount of time. If you do, hey, that's, that's totally fine. Uh, but I'm not going to put a finish on this. However, if you build a brand new workbench and you want, like, the best balance of both worlds, just a little bit of protection from oils and spills and such, but you don't want so much protection like a polyurethane film finish or a lacquer film finish that stuff slides all over the place, my recommendation is Danish oil. It'll penetrate just a little bit and give you a little bit of protection from spills and such, but it's not going to leave you with like this slick film finish that uh, your, your material just slides away from. That's it for this video. I know it's probably much longer than I had originally anticipated because I tend to ramble. But that's okay. Uh, you know what else is okay? Rockler Woodworking and Hardware supporting this video and supporting what I do. That's very much okay. Very much appreciated. If you want to check out some more Rockler stuff, be sure to click the link in the description below. Many links in the description below. I'll have a couple of my favorite Rockler items there. Uh, specifically, two that I used in this particular project, which is the Rockler Pro Lift Router Lift, which is... It's legit. It's pretty darn awesome. As well as their uh, miter sled uh, for the table saw. That thing's pretty darn accurate and pretty cool as well. So check out those two as well as some other stuff. I appreciate it, Rockler, for supporting this video. You guys take care. Have a great day. And I'll talk to you in the next video.